What I want to do today is I want to go through the theme that we had at SEP Tahoe. First of all, thank you for making it possible. Thank you for your prayers because it is are the churches that made it possible, God who opened up the door and we were able to walk through that. It is indeed quite an experience. I, I told my wife because we had kids from 8 years of age to 18 years of age, both boys and girls, and it's a different generation than your generation and our generation. And uh, we'll, I'll kind of end up, but we'll end up our day today visiting a 90-year-old woman who's in her last days of life. And and I think there's a, there's a point in the sermon that I want to mention about her as well. But I was telling my wife that I've never been bossed around by so many little girls and little boys in my whole life. As you try to, to help them to see and to comprehend and to enjoy life from a God perspective. Kids are different. And, you know, it's like, you know, you want them to line up, and it's like herding cats. Or I have this other idea, metaphor. It's like trying to carry an armload of marbles. If you can imagine, you know, like this, and they're just all over the place all the time. But there was a real valid lesson in all of that. It it isn't about me. It isn't about the counselors. It is about what God is doing. And we have to step up the plate, and it isn't easy to be gracious. It isn't easy to be loving. It isn't easy to be kind when kids are kind of smarting off and, and not. You're hoping to try to help them. It's kind of like I was, and you'll have to fill in the blank on this one, I was teaching basketball, and so I decided that the part of this for the, this particular senior group of boys that I had was that there would be a shoot-off on, on free throws, and whoever won the free throw shooting contest would then take me on. And so I heard the kid behind us beginning to laugh, and he says, why, we can beat this old and that's what he said. <laughs> and I laughed. You know, I, had, I was laughing inside of myself uh, because it was a setup. I can shoot through throws as an old man because I don't have to move a whole lot, one. Number two, I knew the, the rim was slanted, which they knew as well, but I had practiced. Number three, it was very springy and bouncy. I mean, unless you just got nothing but net, you weren't going to make the three throws. By the way, I'm going back next year as the free throw shooting champ. So anyhow, it's, it's, it was about all that. But I think it was a God thing, kind of like, you know, to allow that to happen. And then I think about my wife, Karen, who was in Lake Tahoe, like up to three hours a time. If you know how cold Lake Tahoe is, three hours, she comes out shivering, uh, you know, and did that like for three or four days that she was doing these things. And you're, you're doing these things for the kids. And you're hoping. But the theme of, of SEP Tahoe, again, was being rooted. It just had, we had T-shirts and all that. This comes from, first, from Ephesians chapter six, uh, 3, rather, verses 16 through 19. And I want to share it because I believe that what we see here helps us in our walk of life. Um, it also gives me a visual to help me in dealing with young people as well. But in verse 16 of Ephesians chapter 3, we read that our responsibility in our life is pray that out of the glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high and deep the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So that is the theme. Now, in getting this visual, I want to give you a visual that might help you to understand. This is written by the Apostle Paul. 
and the Apostle Paul, who is a disciplinarian, in the sense that the Apostle Paul was quite a legalist. <laughs> this is the way you do it. This is the way of walking in it or off with your kind of, you know, you're going to pay the price. You also have to realize that the Apostle Paul, because of all the things that he had been through, was going through, was kind of an old toot. <laughs> Don't put it that way. And he had been beaten. He had been stoned. He had been through all those kind of things. And you just got to imagine him kind of gnarly. But what is he talking about? And to whom is he talking? He is talking to a church. He is talking to the church at Ephesus. And the Ephesus was the San Francisco of that, that kind of society. They had a lot of things going on in Ephesus. It, you know, there was a lot of sin. Like one kid asked me, sin? What's that? Had no idea of what, what sin was. And... Um, so when we look at these things, we have to understand the, the, the heart that the Apostle Paul had toward God and toward the children, that is, the people, he calls them saints there. So the focus as counselors at SCP Tahoe was the application of God's love. Now, we had to come back home and debrief every evening. You know, it's like, oh my, how would you have handled this? How would I have handled that? And you know, the interesting thing, when we came back in the evening and we're tired, we're worn out, our, our approach was a lot harsher than it was the next morning when we got up and said, no, we thought through this. This isn't about us. This is about showing the grace of God. Uh, the joy that is set before us that we would endure this cross. Nothing like Christ, but it's still the same principle involved in it. Now, it wasn't all bad. There were lots and lots of good things. But the bottom line is we had kids from all over, you know, doing their own things from all age groups and then trying to get them to work together with one another. So it was a challenge for us. It was a challenge for us in terms of application, and are accepting of what we need to do, because again, most many of the, the the dorm parents, as Karen and I were dorm parents, as well as instructors, you know, because uh, we did a lot of different things there. And then the challenge of diversity, both in gender, age, race, understanding, uh, as I say, from those who are, are praising God, young people, which is astounding to see young people who just have a love for God, and then on the other hand, people who, who just have not had the opportunity uh, to know God. It hasn't really been given to them, and if they know God, not a God of love. And this is what we're trying to teach them. So it is a challenge. So it's about planting seed in a fertile, and, and it's it really like that. Some ground was very fertile. Some ground was very shallow. Some ground was very rocky. Uh, those, those are the grounds, but it's like, how do, you, how do you treat them? How do you love them? How do you help them to, to love them? And talking with one of the young, it was like, well, what is it you want to enjoy? What is it? What's your prayer? I'm not going to pray. <laughs> oh, I'm not praying. And I say, well, that's okay. Do you mind if I pray for you? Do you mind if I pray that you, you have fun? You, you find some enjoyment that is, you know, helpful to you. So anyway, it was a challenge. Now, what I want us to look at and, uh, and understand, because all of us, I think all of us, being older people, we've gone through a different kind of society. You know, oftentimes we're told to jump. We ask how high. In my case, it was as I was in the air asking how high, because when I said jump, it was immediate. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like... Oh, um, you know, if if my, you know, my parents said carry out the trash, it didn't mean ten minutes from now. It meant now. It didn't make any difference what I was doing. It was in the moment. And so we have to realize and come to understand that God has a different approach, and God is not a legalistic God. So when we look at God from the beginning, and this is what's important for us to, us to understand, because we're talking about how high, how deep, how wide is the love of God. We have to understand 
that God, from the beginning of our human existence, was love. And how did he demonstrate it in the beginning? In the beginning, God said, let us make man in our image. Let us make man like us. We also see God in the beginning of mankind giving Adam and Eve and giving them a loving relationship, the opportunity for that. We also see God in the very beginning giving them a garden of Eden, which is, in, you know, the way the garden is described is absolutely incredible. And we also see God creating them with no sin. That's how, that's how we see God in the beginning as far as our human. In the middle of our human existence, we see God again demonstrating his love because he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to, to live a human life, to die for us, to be a sacrifice for us. In the middle also, we see God giving to us the Holy Spirit. We also see in the middle of our humanity, uh, God reminding us of the relationship that we are his children. And that he is a loving father. That is what Jesus teaches us. Now we see at the end of our human existence, as the Bible gives us, a new heaven, a new earth. We see God wiping away every tear. There is no more sorrow and there is no more sadness. We also see at the end of it as, as uh, an understanding that we are glorified and that we live and have eternal life in a glorious and wonderful way. Because... God is, as Jeanette read from 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, God is love. It is with that understanding then that we go back to the book of Ephesians and we see the, the heartfelt understanding of the Apostle Paul. He says, for this reason, verse 14, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. It is again a response from the Apostle Paul that seeing who God is and the like, that he cannot help but worship. He kneels. He humbles himself before God. And then he also talks about the whole family. A lot of the times when we're dealing with young people, they feel like they don't belong. And the family that they may belong to may be a gang family. It may be foster children and made all kinds of things but the the feeling of family in our world today is greatly missed in so many many ways but we see the apostle Paul addressing this that the whole family which is inclusive in heaven and earth derives its name and then we begin here with this cause and this overwhelming relationship the acknowledgement of Jesus the belonging the acceptance and heaven and earth certainly suggests a universality to this. So here's what Paul says here in verse 16. And this is what we're trying to help the children to understand. By the way, that I'm trying to help us all understand as well. And to get and gain a deeper understanding. And you moving ahead a little bit, to sink our roots deeper in the true reality of God. Verse 16, though, so he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being. For as We see here, and our, our prayer is that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Now, we have to understand that when we think about God, first of all, it is God granting to us. God grants. God gives. The Father is a gracious giver. We think about our calling. It is that God calls us. God draws us to his son Jesus in and, and his giving. And that he has the richness of his glory. Our Heavenly Father is rich in the things that really count. Not that God doesn't own everything. He owns everything. He created God. Or Jesus created everything by Jesus. All of that, the gold, the silver, the uranium, everything that is valuable along with that print cartridge ink which is very valuable <laughs> if you don't realize it it is the most valuable liquid in the world uh, but anyway God is the one who has a richness but it's glory that's beyond gold it is much more glorious than gold glory that is beyond good we think oh my if I had richness if I had goodness no the glory of God is beyond the price of gold the glory of God is beyond the, the goodness that we might think of something being good. 
that he says here that strengthened with might by his spirit. The fruits of the Holy Spirit, when, we, when we're looking at the, what God is doing, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, power, love, and sound mind. And to help children to understand that the power that God would, that God has won, and that he would ha- also have us have a, a power through the Holy Spirit. It is a confidence about what God is doing in our lives. But also of love and of a sound mind. It is, we live in a crazier and crazier world than ever before. Everyone, just about day, is diagnosed with some kind of disorder. We, and it, it's just, that's the way it is. And the disorder may be that we're disorderly as, as well. We don't want to take responsibility for our humanity, uh, who we are, and in the way in which God has created us, and to step up to the plate with the weaknesses that we have. Because, brethren, we all have weaknesses. For every strength we have, there's the opposite. There is a weakness. We, you know, we can be very, very, as it were, uh, straightforward, easy for us to do things, have everything in order. On the one hand, on the other hand, we're totally inflexible. We can't let something happen in a way that doesn't fit our regimen, our routine. So strengthen us, it is by the Spirit. And then when we look at the Spirit of God and, and trying to remind us that what really truly is valuable, and by the way, when we think about being rooted, we think of, in essence of a tree, a tree grows, a pr- tree produces fruits in one way or another. We think about fruit trees in particular, it has a reason, the quality of the fruit that, that we have, also the sharing of the fruit. There is great joy in sharing, but we look at the quality of the fruit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance, meekness. Those are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Now, trying to working with children young people to try to instill that but also having that in yourself that is allowing the Holy Spirit to work with you to be temperate (laughs) to be meek to be long suffering because (laughs) we had a, a case where they were the girls were like being crowned princes of God they had gone through a a class on purity and they were being crowned prince, and they couldn't get a couple of guys to just man up as it were and take it seriously and it just you know was aggravating we kept working through this and practicing and, and I was wanting to say oh if I were doing this I said hey you're out of here <laughs> and you're out of here and or straighten up and fly right or back in the old days bend over We'll give you two strokes to see if you like that. You know, after it was all over and the next day you realize, hey, you know, I mess up and goof off and don't take God serious a lot of things and he still is kind to me and I didn't like it and all of that, but God is so gracious and hopefully down the road they will have learned and will learn a lesson. But he strengthens us with the fruits of the Spirit in the inner man. That is, in our hearts, in our souls, the inner man. It's not just a facade. So we're not trying to teach these kids something that they just look good on the outside, but actually know God from the inside. From the inside out, which is a totally different thing. So when we think about rooted and grounded, because you can have a tree that's growing and it's rotten on the inside. And you got problems with that. So it, it tells us that according to the riches of his glory, that Christ, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. It is Christ in us. Now, and what is it that we know that Christ in us can, that we can do? He says, well, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthens me. I'm reminded now of the the guys were called knights and they had their swords and the the ladies walked underneath of it but they had the front row of all those knights had to kneel well they weren't quite prepared for what they were kneeling on 
It just happened to be, it was basically cinders. You ever try to kneel and bare knee on cinders? The, um, the, ins- the uh, director said, look guys, it's time for you to man up. Sacrifice hurts. Wow, what a life lesson. It isn't that I don't know that it hurts, but sacrifice hurts when you're doing something to honor somebody else. It's quite a lesson. And of course, I'm sitting back there, I'm watching my own grandson, you know, kneeling that, and he's in pain over that. But my granddaughter, who was part of the, the, the women there, next day she's saying, I think my wife put it this way, it was so sweet of those boys to do that and to see that. And you know, where you begin to honor what the, the sacrifice that other people go through and appreciate it. So there are incredible life lessons. I personally was going to go get a long two before, put it down so they can kneel on it. You know, brethren, sometimes you want to intervene in you. In the long run, that's not the best thing to do. In the long run, uh, life, we all know life can be painful. All you ladies who go through childbirth, you know, it's painful. All who go through sadness and sorrow for other people, it is painful. So Christ that dwells in our heart, that, and it's not, it's not us, it's Christ that does, works in us. But also, brethren, there's another point of this, is that you have other guys doing the same thing. It is so helpful to understand that we're not in this alone. First of all, we have God. We have the Holy Spirit. We have Jesus Christ. We have one another. We are not in this alone. It is very important for us to understand. And that we live by, by faith. That is, we trust God. It's important. Even though we don't see every God, that we learn to trust God. We have faith in God and appreciate that. So it's important. So when I think about being rooted and grounded in love, and I think that sometimes we have to, again, reevaluate historically where we have been. I looked for yesterday, I couldn't find them, but a set of scripture cards that we had, that I had as a pastor, I had as a student at Ambassador College that Carol would remember, and maybe Carol has them, because I was going to do a little thing with them. I was going to shuffle them up and pick six of them at random and compare them with a little memo that we got from Joe DeConch, because Joe was doing this little thing about, he was saying, David Letterman has his top ten. I think many of you are familiar with his list of top ten things. He said, people are always asking me what are my top tens. But in this particular case, he was doing scriptures. What are his top ten scriptures? And I was going to take those cards and just take six. And I was going to make a bet that at least four out of the six in the top, uh, that I would draw would be something to do with sin, you know, law. Uh, there would be something in that regard. Here were Joe Tkach's top six scriptures. One, First John 4, 8. The, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Two, for this freedom that Christ has set us free, stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again with the yoke of slavery. Three, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Four, God demonstrates his own love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Five, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Six, for Christ's love compels us because he is convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all and those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. These are all very, very positive scriptures about the love of God. That is what we are to be rooted in and as we move forward here. So life is not about our lives and not about knowing everything, but having faith in God that He knows what He is doing.
and we all have had those situations in our life where we think, well, this is the way I would do it. And then at the end of the day, so to speak, we say, oh, my. If I had done it that way, it, it would have been a big mess. At the end of camp, you see kids, and you see the progress. Even those who didn't even know what sin was, you see that there's a smile on their face. There's a difference. It may be small, but there is a difference in their life. So then he goes on to tell us, rooted and grounded in love. Roots are what hold us and get, hold us firm and give us nutrition. We are not rooted in hate, in jealousy, in envy or greed. We're, we're not rooted in the deeds of the devil. We're not rooted in legalism. Sometimes uh, we... You know, it's like, well, what does the law say? How does that? But as the Apostle Paul himself reminded us, we're giving a ministry of reconciliation. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So we recognize that. Nor are we rooted in self-righteousness. That, oh, we'll just, I, I, I just do everything perfectly. And we'll make everybody march to the same drum and in the same way and everything just an absolute perfect unison and the like. We're not that way. Nor are we rooted in lawlessness. But rather we are, we are rooted in love. And like roots, roots go down. You don't see most of the roots. Sometimes they pop up on top and the like. But basically you don't see them. They're below the surface. However, brethren, my point to us when we think about the Apostle Paul is that our taproot should go straight down, as it were. The taproot goes down, and it is rooted in love. Because who is God? From beginning, middle, and end, it is about the love of God. Now, when I say love, does that make it easy? No, it is not easy to do that to love but it is what God desires for us to do wants us to do and then he says in verse 18 that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints now think about comprehend here's what Paul wants us I, I'm reminded of the Proverbs says, with all your getting get understanding that you'll be able to comprehend understand to know again with all the saints Oftentimes, in our humanity we want to know what other people don't know. we got our little areas that I, I know this and the like. There's inclusiveness in this knowing and also there's another point. Saints. We will know with all the saints. That's in everybody involved in it. And it reminds me of one of the classes that we had on teamwork. Team building. And it was like they're, they're given this project where they have these little stepping stones. And they're given one stone beyond the number of people in there and they've got to cross this bayou with alligators over there and they can never lose contact with that stone and they had to figure out how to do it on their own. Interesting thing, the girls talked about it, figured it out and all that before they ever set foot. The guys, they started walking immediately. They did not do it very successfully and they could only think one way. And everybody was trying to boss everyone. It took them a long time in. But eventually, most of them got all the way over and back. But it was a hoot to watch them try. But I saw in one case, where, you know, where they're, they're absolutely holding the other person so that they can get through and they can do all of, of those things. Interesting enough, the group uh, that I was a dorm parent got there and got back. Not without frustration and all of that. And the other group was stuck out there in the middle of the bayou trying to get back. And here was the interesting point, so I suggested to them, teamwork. Why don't you go take your stones now and go rescue them? They're almost here, but you're already safe. Why don't you go rescue them? And you know what the other team said? No, we want to do it ourselves. We don't want to be rescued. We want to do it ourselves. And then after a little more time, it, it was amazing how easy it was when they finally acquiesced to it. 
and this other team put their stones out. They just went out there, and they all just walked. Like walking through the Red Sea, they walked home free and easy. But you see, it, it, a matter of teamwork is, is not just saving your group, your hide. It's also teamwork, and it comes to saints, that we work for one another. We help one another. That is what our fellowship is about. We do that as well. So that we may be able to comprehend the breadth, the length, the, the de- uh, height, um, the, the, the fullness of God. How deep is the love of God? It isn't just a shallow thing. It's very the dimensions that expand, that are so expansive, and the vistas that we see in the love of God. We see old people caring for young people, but you also see young people helping old people. It, again, is one of those things to know the love, to comprehend the love of God. And then verse 19 of Ephesians 3, to know the love of Christ. It is important that we know not just God, but we know Christ because, you see, Christ is our link between God the Father and our humanity. He is human. He, he became one of us. He is our high priest. And sometimes we say, well, no, we'll rescue ourselves. We'll just go to God. And Jesus is saying, look, I came to save you. Let me help. No, we can do it ourselves. No, brethren, we cannot do it ourselves. You know, even in our genders, we weren't created to be by ourselves. And as people, we're not created to be ourselves. God has given us fellowship to enjoy with one another. And a relationship with him as well. To know the love of Christ... Let us, you know, as it were, count the ways that God loves us, that Jesus loves us. It, and by the way, brethren, the point that it says here in Ephesians, it passes knowledge. It isn't that you can look this up like a factoid. This is just a fact. Um, you don't tell your spouse, well, it's just a fact that I love you. There is a lot of stuff that goes into the fact that if I say into the fact it's beyond facts it's beyond the physical it's beyond the material love that is spiritual love that is of the spirit and by the way love that is beyond words because sometimes you just do not have the words for the love of the awesome God you see a God's creation. You see Lake Tahoe, one of the most beautiful lakes in the entire world. You smell the pines there. You, you, you feel the awesomeness of God, the great creator. It's beyond words. When I watched my grand, as I was actually one of the sword bearers and all that, and I heard my granddaughter's name called out in the purity session and she comes walking through with a crown and I see my grandsons, you know, kneeling as knights. I was pretty proud. It was beyond words. How proud. You see, the love God has for us is beyond our words. And we're, we're learning in that regard. And then he goes on to fill with the fullness of God. Not just filled, but filled with the fullness of God. It's like God wants us, well, eternal life is to know the Father and the Son. The fullness of God of who He is. That He is love. And to enjoy that. Then it goes on to tell us, in wrapping it up, because I'm just focusing on the center part of that. But he says in verse 20, God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond, beyond what we ask, beyond what we think, according to the power that works in us. There is an incredible power working in us. We allow God to work his will in our life. And the end result, verse 30, 21 of Ephesians, glory to God by Jesus Christ forever. It's like you leave there and you say, Thank you, Lord. It is by your power, by your might, by your spirit. Thank you. You are a glorious God. 
Help us to live that way. Help us to send our roots down, not into rock, not into hate, envy, or the things of the devil, but our roots are in the love of God. That's our life, and thereby we produce fruit that we share with one another. And it's awesome to see what God is doing. Thank you for your being rooted in the love of God. And may those kids who left and go, the seed is planted, may their roots begin to grow. And then they begin to sprout up and grow. It takes, it's, obviously, it's, it's a whole lifelong process for the love of God. But that's where, what God would have for us. That's what Paul tells us. So you got to, again, re- be reminded this old, cranky kind of guy that on the exterior looks like a tired, worn-out old blank. But out of the heart flows the love of God. May God have all the glory and the praise. Let's conclude in prayer. We thank you, Father in heaven, for your loving kindness. And we thank you that truly that our lives are to be rooted in in your love because you are a God of love, exemplified by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we live in love to your glory and honor. And in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Feeling the blues today? Or tired of life already? Do you have questions about life or need spiritual advice? The Worldwide Church of God is located in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto, California. We welcome everyone to attend our worship services with us every week at the times listed on your screen.